just connected. Okay, so over to you, Simon. I think we're ready, aren't we? Shall I start? Yes, please do. Yeah, okay. We know that the changes that have taken place in agriculture in the past have badly affected butterflies and other wildlife. Many of our rarer butterflies have declined by 90% or more, depends whether you look at them in terms of numbers or you look at them in terms of range. Are the current changes that are taking place in agriculture are going to destroy what is left? You know, for instance, we it's it's over 100 years since we lost the uh, large copper uh, from from um, Cambridge and places, and uh, that has disappeared through many part areas of Europe. And some of the uh, it, it disappeared in the eight, in the 19th century, not just in recently, because of the land drainage that occurred in many places. Now, unlike the UK, much of Eastern Europe and most of the mountains of Europe still have peasant pastoral systems with flower rich grasslands where the farming system has yet to change. They haven't been improved in quite the same way yet as they have in uh, modern lowland Britain. These are often very good places for butterflies. But the changing economies are a huge threat to these agricultural communities as they cannot compete without subsidies with factory farming. Uh, if you're producing uh, lamb or beef uh, in the tops of mountains or in um, Eastern Europe on poor pastures, um, you can't compete with the um, factory farming of chicken and things like that, um, and you can't make enough money out of it. There's a big threat also when people um, give up agriculture, that the land goes two different ways, or at least it, the, the, the threat is that it can either be absorbed into something which is very improved and uses lots of fertilizer and it becomes just like modern lowland Britain. But also there's a quite a lot of land is actually abandoned. I remember going in the Pyrenees 20 years ago and finding many hay meadows that hadn't been harvested. They look absolutely wonderful at the moment, but you knew that in a few years time, they would be overrun with scrub and very little interest of butterflies. It is unusual to see people taking hay like these people in Romania. There are still reasonably um, robust systems of agriculture in some of the poorer countries of Europe, but in so many places, the modernization, the track, you know, the tractors, the fertilizers, the sprays is taking over. Now I'm going to start by telling you a bit about me because I, I've been interested in butterflies since 1954, which is rather a long time. And I made the mistake of becoming an, uh, an entomologist in the days when conservation was of insects was actually unheard of. So the only sort of jobs you could get as an entomologist were in things like pest control, and I went to Africa to spray locusts, basically, and I became totally disillusioned with um, chemical um, agriculture and particularly spraying of organochlorine insecticides. And when I finished that job, I moved to Oxford to do a doctorate on DDT pollution to try and find out why it was such a, a dangerous substance. And having finished that and effectively made myself unemployable by the chemical industry, because I was obviously uh, someone who was going to complain about things, I moved to Wales to become a self-sufficient smallholder. And I, bought a, I was lucky enough to be able to buy a smallholding in, in 1975, which was a long time ago. And we keep, kept sheep and cattle and 
raised organic children on three hectares and grow lots of, grew lots of vegetables and fruit organically. Now, I always managed my uh, small holding for wildlife. I've recently sold it and I now can do green wings tours for butterflies. But the, 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 the first part of the talk is how do you manage your own piece of land to get as many butterflies as possible? And I'll come to that in a minute. I've been working part time as a consultant on butterflies for more than 30 years. And I've worked on pearl border fritillary in Wales and other butterflies, mainly for the local wildlife trusts and other organizations. And most recently last year with Richard Smith, some, who some of you will know, on the high brown fritillary in the Allen Valley in South Wales. I currently have a, a project on uh, a golf course um, about 10 miles away, clearing scrub and butterflies on a, a wonderful limestone, limestone grassland area. And we're trying to get back the grassland flora and the butterflies. I will tell you quite a lot about that in a moment. I have engaged with the farming community in Wales a long campaign for better ag agri-environment schemes. I'm quite involved with the politics and um, I'm very keen that we have a sensible approach to uh, agri-environment schemes in Wales and often they are not sensible. I was chair of Butterfly Conservation's European Butterflies Group for its first 12 years and I have traveled extensively in Europe looking at butterflies um, Europe has over 450 species, and I don't think I'll get around them all, but I'm getting quite close. And I would, you know, I'm going to spend the rest of my retirement trying to do that, leading Green Wings tours in places like Greece and Turkey and wherever I can. And um, uh, that, that's what I want to do now. So I'm going to start with the very local um, how to run a small holding for butterflies. Move on to managing land for butterflies and what happens when you it gets abandoned and move on to the wider European perspective. So that was my small holding in Wales. I don't miss it. Every time I go there, I think, gosh, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, I, that needs doing. And it was an incredible amount of work. We used to have sheep and cattle and uh, lots of vegetables and it was sort of 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days of the year and it was a wonderful life but not when when you get to a certain age so uh, i sold it a couple of years ago and uh, I now can do different things travel a lot more and that's wonderful this field on my small holding was always managed for butterflies since I bought it. It's um, it's about half the it's about one and a half acres, uh, one and a half hectares. Um, it's never been ploughed. It's never been reseeded. It's never been drained. It's not had fertilizer. It's not had lime, um, and it has a fabulous collection of butterflies, obviously things like meadow brown and ringlets, uh, but we also get dark green fertility and uh, it's absolutely full of hay rattle. And the hay rattle is very important because the hay rattle is a, a parasite of the grasses. And instead of having lots of uh, uh, perennial rye grasses, what farmers normally want to grow, we get Yorkshire fog and lots of lots of bents and sort of softer grasses, which are still the food plants of some of the butterflies. And uh, the parasitism of the grasses reduces the foot, the uh, growth of the grasses and allows things like birds for trefoil and dandelions and all sorts of flowers to flower. And uh, it's rich floristically as well as um, for butterflies. We've got devil's bit scabious in, in the autumn. We don't have marsh fritillaries, but uh, it's too small an area, but that, it, that's the sort of thing we, 
we have in abundance. This is the list of species that we have. I think it comes to 30 now. It's worth pointing out a few of these things. Essex skipper um, arrived about five years ago uh, and wasn't present before, but that's quite interesting. Um, we had white leather hair streak um, eventually colonized the um, el small witch elm trees that I planted there, most of which have died now. Um, and I did, uh, did record it a couple of times um, after about waiting 10 or 15 years. You have to have patience with this sort of thing. Common blue is, um, occurs, but it's always in very low numbers. We get uh, quite often quite good numbers of dark green fritillary, um, sort of half a dozen flying at a time in, a, in, in the field. We have one record on in my last year there of silver wash fritillary because um, that is spreading. It's, we're right on the northern edge of its range. The pearl border fertility was never recorded on my small holding, but I, as recently as 1984, it occurred on some of the uh, the bracken slopes above us, and I I have a very occasionally found small pearl border fertility, but obviously we get all the other things uh, that you normally get, like tortoiseshells and commas, but also wall brown, um, um, speckled wood. I haven't seen a small heath for years, but they did occur at one time. So that gives you a, a sort of feel for um, a sort of wildlife oasis um, in a sea of overgrazed uh, Welsh sheep farms. We left the field ungrazed from the 1st of March until August, and then we put cattle in from August till October, and the cattle went into very long grass. Now remember, cattle can eat long grass. They don't mind long grass at all. Sheep don't, can't manage it at all. We used to use, graze it with a few sheep in the winter. It was very difficult to cut for hay because it was often extremely wet because it had never been drowned. Most people don't realize that the, there were huge numbers of grants for draining land in the 70s and 80s. Um, and the rest of our fields were drained uh, under a 90% grant, um, which was basically a 100% grant in, in 1979, uh, but this field wasn't. We never put any manure there. We never use any fertilizer. Occasionally we cut the rushes or the blackthorn and we wouldn't normally feed much supplementary hay unless we had to. We would occasionally give the cows apples for, for management because if, if you came up with a bucket of apples, they would follow you. And uh, we kept uh, a bull, uh, which, is, which is at the back here, um, who um, allowed us to go on holiday because we weren't available for doing all the um, uh, AI and getting them in and ringing up the AI man when we noticed they were bullying. It was much easier to have a bull. And it was lovely. You could go and put your arms around, the, around his neck in the middle of the field. Now, I live amongst commercial farmers. You know, my son-in-law is the... Uh, NFU chair locally. I'm, I've talked to, 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 to farming groups. I, I engage with the farming community. And I, the, 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 the thing that most conservationists don't realize is that for any farmer who is highly indebted to take this sort of thing on themselves, is totally uneconomic because the pr production is very low and uh, the profits are very, very small and um, they would need quite a lot of money from the agri-environment scheme to compensate from the loss of income. Now that does work in some places. It does work with large farms, particularly up from farms that aren't, haven't been terribly intensively farmed 
But if you're paying ten thousand pounds on the acre, um, for an acre of land and you are borrowing the money from the bank and you're trying to buy it, pay it back as quickly as possible, then you cannot make good money out of um, pasture in this way. You need your fertilizers, you need your drainage, you need your reseeding, you need your rich um, lays that uh, make it possible to grow large quantities of milk or meat. Um, and that is, un so it's uneconomic. Now, we have actually lost nearly all our species rich pasture anyway. There's only 2% that remains in the UK. And the farming unions would say that if we tried to go back to that, we would all starve. I think it's possible on upland farms where, where you've got an extensive grazing system with low levels of stock, stock and low inputs, um, you can you can greatly re reduce the costs that you put into the farming enterprise, and that that allows you to produce um, some profit because even though the output is actually quite small, conservation grazing works, but it doesn't pay the bank back for buying the land. Most intensive dairy sheep. An arable land in the UK has very few species of butterfly and at very low density. They occur on the edges, the, the odd bits uh, um, which they can't plough. Um, it helps a lot if the ground is very steep. It helps um, if you've got a bit of woodland. It helps if you've got um, roadsides next door to it because the roadsides are often better for the butterflies. Than, than the arrow, the green desert in between. So butterflies tend to survive on roadsides, gardens, quarries, in woodland particularly, on military land, on common land, and on nature reserves. And there are very few butterflies in intensive farmed landscapes like Wales. The surviving rare butterfly sites are usually open, um, unimproved, often calcareous grassland. They can be do well in actively managed woodland, but that can often get too shaded. It's un uneconomic to graze or manage m many of the sort of steep bits or small bits, and these tend to become abandoned. And when you abandon um, land, it usually goes back to, to, to woodland at some stage, often via, by a scrub, and uh, you lose the value for butterflies. So usually when, when you have a good butterfly site, it's an, ac it's an accident of history. One of the ones I'm going to talk about is Clannamon at Rocks um, near Austria, which is an abandoned quarry. This was grazed in the past, and we're trying to great grazing back to it. There are other good wildlife sites in the area, which are also which are, are commons, and they've escaped the agricultural improvement because they weren't owned, owned by one individual; they were owned by a group of individuals, all of whom had rights. So, if anyone spent a lot of money. Uh, putting fertilizer or draining it or or improving it, he had to share the proceeds with other people. So they didn't actually happen. And the other place that's extremely good for uh, butterflies is military land, because uh, unexploded ordnance certainly discourages plowing and uh, driving across it in tanks and shelling it frequently is beneficial. I remember doing a, uh, helping a friend with a project. Well, I was helping with the English, that's all, uh, on a piece of military land in um, in Germany. And uh, it was extraordinary how exactly the same thing had happened there, that it, that, that it had resisted all attempts to improve it agriculturally, and it was still extremely good for wildlife. Now, remember, 
we nearly starved during World War II. And post-war, the agricultural policy, policy subsidized improvements to land and the modernization of agriculture. It all really happened since the war. There were grants for draining, there were grants for liming, and there were grants for plowing up and reseeding. And this was made much easier by mechanization and the modern industrial chemistry could produce the fertilizer and the pesticides cheaply, uh, which the uh, farmers could use. And the stock numbers went up and uh, our pr the productivity of our pastures uh, in terms of milk and meat was dramatically increased. Now, farmers have until recently always had uh, common agricultural policy subsidies, and certainly in Wales, these are these often were more, they got more in subsidy than they actually made in profit. So if they had stayed in bed and just banked the subsidy, they would have often be, been better off. We don't, well, the subsidies from the single farm payment um, after Brexit are going to eventually disappear. And many farmers uh, in Wales particularly are struggling financially and they are attempting to survive by it intensifying with uh, IPUs, in industrial poultry units. And um, the whole point of them is that they produce an enormous amount of fertilizer, which then cuts down their fertilizer. You know, the, the chicken manure is a, a very useful fertilizer from the point of view of the farmer and very bad for, for the river Y and very bad for the butterflies because it makes all the land uh, very fertile. Now, few commercial farmers will be able to, in my opinion, few commercial farmers will be able to benefit from the environmental land management schemes in England or the sustainable f farming schemes in Wales. The only people that I can see that are going to really benefit are very large holdings, people like the National Trust, people at the, like the RSPB, but many sort of standard uh, commercial agricultural people, they haven't got the wildlife to, get, to put into it in the first place. And if they stuck to the uh, rules of the system, they, their profits would be severely limited. They wouldn't be allowed to sp spread so much manure. They wouldn't be able to use so much fertilizer and their product production would actually reduce, uh, therefore their profits would reduce. So I think there's going to be a crisis in Wales uh, particularly, but also in other uh, upland areas of the country where livestock farming is the, is the backbone um, from uh, farmers going bankrupt um, and um, land possibly being abandoned or amalgamated e into even bigger holdings. After all, if you owe the bank a lot of money, rewilding is not really an option. It doesn't produce an income and it doesn't pay the bank. And with interest rates rising, these people are getting squeezed. What does this do for butterflies? You see, butterflies don't use perennial ryegrass as their food plant. None of them do. The fertilizers reduce the floristic diversity and, and they promote the growth of unsuitable grasses. All right, you get some clovers and things like um, clouded yellows will use clovers occasionally. Also, my neighbors start cutting silage even in late April, or if definitely in early May, and they the, the cuts of the grass mean that any butterfly that's laid its eggs in there has not yet completed its life cycle. They need to wait till late July at the earliest to, to, com to come out and um, uh, from their pupae. Um, the reseeding and the lay farming ensures that, you know, that there are no butterflies uh, or very few butterflies on, on most commercial farms and farmers quite 
not understandably use weed killers to remove nettles and docks. And these are both used by butterflies. When you've got intensive sheep farming, the very short grass means you have very few butterflies. Anything that gets laid on those uh, on that grass um, gets eaten very quickly. Uh, what happens when land is um, abandoned? Because that's what happens to all sorts of pieces of um, small bits of land. You know, where you've got small holdings, where you've got small fields, people tend to say, oh, I can't be bothered with this. It's just not worth the effort. So it's fine for the first few years. For a start, you get long grass, which is good for some butterfly species like some of the skippers and bad for others like um, small heath. You start to get bramble and scrub invading. And after a while, you get species like ash and sycamore and hawthorn becoming established. The hawthorn comes in by being dropped by birds. The ash usually blows in. Over many years, the trees get bigger and shade out the grassland and the flowers. Eventually, it gets called secondary woodland. And if you wait long enough, it becomes oak woodland as the oak replaces the, the, the pioneer trees. And after several thousand years, you will, of course, get ancient woodland, which we all love, but you have to wait a long time. Now, Clallamonic is uh, an interesting place. and. We've had lots of projects over the years because it is effectively been abandoned for grazing for a long time. I'll show you some photographs in a minute. We've had lots of projects over the years. We, we've had lots of scrub clearance. We've done bracken management. We've worked on two reserves and uh, also on a golf course. And we just get, well, it's quite obvious that the uh, scrub clearance without grazing does not work that if you don't follow up the scrub clearance with grazing, you will get even more scrub um, in a few years time, especially if you don't bother to treat the stumps. And um, for instance, one of the reserves uh, is owned by the Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust. They're organic. They can't use any stump treatment. And but no one wants to bring their organic livestock there. Uh, because they can't be bothered. Um, it's too difficult. So we got surveys and recording and we we're just, just desperate because so many butterflies are being lost. This is a picture of it. The if you can see this, the, the reserve is lower down. This is the Shropshire bit. That's the Montgomeryshire bit. And this is the golf course, which is mainly in Wales, in Montgomeryshire. And this is an area where I've got a, a big project at the moment, because actually the golf course is extremely good for butterflies, because although the fairways, these bits are mowed regularly, some of some of the areas are left fairly long and only cut once a year. What has happened in the past is we've had uh, uh, scrub uh, growing up and turning to trees over a period of years. That's what it looked like in the 1920s. It was as bold as a coot. It had shepherded grazing. There was a chap who used to run a large number of sheep over it uh, and graze it very heavily indeed. I want you to look out for that, this, this corner hill, which is called Astley Rocks, because that's Astley Rocks now. This is what this is uh, 10, 20 years ago uh, when we we did some clearance. The trees have all come come since the 20s and it's turned into secondary woodland. Why is Dunamonic uh, Rocks a, um, a good place for butterfly? Now, the, the, the first thing is it's limestone grassland. So we have a diverse grassland flora with lots lots of things like rock rose and um, violets and things like that. There's lots of flowers. We've got areas of bracken. It's very south facing and um, 
it's a very warm site. So we get things like dingy skipper. We get things like grizzled skipper, both of which are quite common in that, in, particularly on the the um, SSSI, the Tlanamanag SSSI itself, but also in the neighbouring sort of 10 kilometres of the Oswestry Hills. So you've got a meta population structure with um, reasonably good populations scattered over a large area. And these two species are, are not, not common any, any longer in, in Wales and they're doing reasonably well. Well, they're doing quite well on Thanamanak and we hope they will do better. We have small pearl border fertility, which is still occurs on the reserves and has occurred on the golf course. That usually, I think in this case, it's not using wet habitats, it's using bracken habitats. We used to have pearl border fertility mainly in the bracken areas on Clannamullet rocks, but uh, it was lost in 2003. We had a, a reintroduction pro project uh, to put in um, captive bread stock, which was okay for a few years. As you probably know, it feeds on violets. It needs nectar sources. There's plenty of nectar there. It needs uh, a south facing warm site and some other um, limestone pavement or limestone sites like uh, Ias rocks in, um, in near Ruthin are, are, are also pearl border fertility sites. So it's, it, it's, it's, I think there are only eight sites now for pearl border fertility in Wales. There used to be 100 in 1980. So we've got a, re a recent project. Um, it's on the uh, SSSI, so we have to deal very closely with NRW and their uh, SSSI team, but they have been extremely helpful and they put me on to finding this money um, in the first place. We have to get permission for everything from the scheduled ancient monument people, but they're quite good. Uh, we, we got 91,000 uh, in 2021 to spend on scrub clearance and equipping the golf course with various bits of equipment, uh, including uh, helping to get grazing back, which we are doing slightly slowly, but we've got we've been using cattle there on part of it and we want to extend it. Now we've cleared huge amounts of scrub for butterflies and restore the limestone grass. And we've just done this patch up here and it's really going quite well. Um, it was, you know, it, this area was grazed by sheep until 1979. But the trouble is that when you stop grazing, it, an awful lot of scrub and hawthorn uh, went in, was, came in over those years. And although I, um, started introducing um, livestock in the early 2000 when I was, had a project with Montgomery Wildlife Trust we put in some Hebridean sheep the trouble is they there weren't enough of them and uh, there was a big problem with dog walk, walkers uh, it's a great place for emptying dogs so um, it was difficult for the sheep and the sheep used to go and hide up in the rocks where they weren't actually doing much good or hide down in the woods when they, where they weren't doing much good and they've now gone. So we're trying to get cattle there now, um, uh, which uh, cattle are more robust when it comes to dealing with dogs, but this is um, quite, quite difficult. And although the Shropshire Wildlife Trust do manage to get cattle on some of their um, um, reserves, um, we've, you know, the Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust uh, haven't been able to get cattle back. So if you, this is what we, we, we've been clearing on the golf course. This is the edge of the fairway where you've got hawthorn scrub and bracken and bramble growing up in a dense uh, thicket. And we have cleared all, a lot of that uh, to uh, allow the grassland to reappear. When we've 
cleared places, we try and get these decks to cattle in, similar to what I used to keep. And they do, they follow up the grazing, you know, grazing the scrub and the regrowth, and that works quite well. But it's it, there's no economy to it. These these are cows, but they're not put to the calf. They have no produce, and it's a huge uh, financial drain for the Shropshire Wildlife Trust. So how long they go on doing it, I don't know. But I'm trying to make it um, sustainable for a longer term. That's some land that we've just recently cleared. It was um, a bit of a nightmare, really. We we were using contractors, but the and the local SSSI team of NRW were extremely helpful, and they'd already consented all the work. But we, it took us nine months to get a felling license out of another half of NRW. And about um, two months before we they at the end, um, they insisted that we did an environmental impact assessment, which was completely ridiculous, really, when you um, consider that the work had already been consented and was required for maintenance of the SSSI. I I despair of NRW ever have getting to the point where they have joined up thinking. So you have one half of NRW spending an awful lot of time producing maps and measuring uh, tree volumes and things like that um, to get uh, uh, the other half of NRW to issue the re relevant licenses. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on making that a slightly more efficient process and we'll rather enjoy winding a few people up. So it's not the first time we've done projects on the golf course. They play golf on this bit, so it's mown every week. This bit is left to go wild. And this is bracken, which we've cut. Now that's fine. It needs cutting occasionally. And if when you have bonfires, you get an absolute Mass of violence, uh, which is wonderful for the Pearl Board of Artilleries, but I'm afraid they have now gone. Now, let's look ahead and uh, see what whether the situation in Europe is going to be as gloomy as I predict. Um, the If you travel in Europe, and I've been to lots and lots of places, and I'm always interested in, in what is happening in the landscape. And very often you get vast areas with um, mono, monocultures, heavily fertilized agriculture, a few uh, things like uh, wind turbines to make it, you know, have a secondary use to the land, which is not a problem, but it's, uh, there is no wildlife there at all, or extremely little, and particularly no butterflies. So the intensification of agriculture over much of Western Europe um, is, is intense, and Eastern Europe is going the same way. When you think of Holland or places like that, the, apart from places reserved for nature, um, th there is very little wildlife where you've had wetlands, they've now been drained and the land has now been improved. There's been a European wide increase in agricultural production and every all the farmers are totally addicted to using pesticides and fertilizers. And most of lowland Europe is now a wildlife desert. This is happening as much in Eastern Europe and they're catching up but they have retained wildlife friendly practices until recently. Do you know about the, um, uh, when you drive in some of these places, you suddenly say, realize that you're in an, an area with lots of insects because you have to go and clean the windscreen. Um, and that doesn't occur, ha happen nowadays in Western Europe. Very rarely do you have to go and get some bug, bug remover to clean the windscreen because nothing actually sticks to the windscreen because there's nothing flying there anyway. But occasionally you go to places in Western Europe, sorry, in Eastern Europe, which um, still have quite a lot of insects. 
and insect numbers in general have declined dramatically across <laughs> large areas of Europe. Even when you've got marginal land uh, nowadays, it's used for vines, it's used for olives. Uh, those of you who have driven around Spain recently, you'll find huge acreages of almond orchards uh, in, the, in the hills uh, that have been planted recently, probably under common agricultural land, um, common agricultural policy subsidies. When you have livestock, um, it's often very intensive and often based in sheds. And because food is cheap and it, you, it can travel easily across Europe, it's very difficult for many livestock farmers, particularly in the less favored mountain areas to, to compete. And they tend to either give up farming or the farms are sold uh, to larger units that will only do things like uh, grow um, maize in the best bits. In many of the best places in Europe for butterflies, usually in the mountains, there is a big problem with land abandonment. And abandoning land is the same problem as we had at Tlanomonic Rocks. You get the scrub, you get the um, growth trees, and Europe's uh, tree cover is uh, increasing all the time. Um, and uh, you, you lose the grassland. So you remember most, uh, we, know, we, we know an enormous amount about um, our butterflies. Um, it's probably one of the best historical biogeographical data sets in the world. We've got records going back to 1800. We've had atlases in 1984 and 2000. And uh, there are thousands and thousands of records covering nearly all of Britain and Ireland. In Europe, um, we know quite a lot about what happened, you know, what was the distribution of butterflies going back over 200 years. And they're more tied, butterflies are much more tied to their habitat than say birds and are very much more sensitive to management. Um, Artica Kudno is a, a uh, the first one to map European butterflies, um, produced the first map distribution maps for all species of butterflies in Europe. And where you've got red dots here, you've got the area, the hot spots uh, where you find them. And that's mainly in the mountains. It's very interesting to compare the the, the, the where different countries in Europe have got to. Now, obviously, we're used to in, in the UK having extremely good coverage of uh, butterfly distribution and uh, massive numbers of records and massive numbers of recorders and um, coverage for virtually every 10 kilometers square. Um, Holland is about is also pretty good that it's a smaller country, but they they are very keen on their wildlife and um, they know their butterflies very well. Italy has most butterflies, but by far the least systematic recording. There's very few records, there's no maps, uh, they, they, there's very little information, there are very few active groups in Italy. So if you, anyone wants to retire to somewhere warm and do something useful, please go to Italy. France has much less well-known um, butterflies than um, in the UK, but it's got a hell of a lot more species. And there are now several regional atlases in France, and um, there is much more activity than before. Uh, in 2013, butterfly, a European Butterflies Group read a conference in France in French, where we invited Jim Asher to come and sort of open it. And dear old Jim, he started his talk in French, uh, basically said, you know, this is ours, where's yours uh, about the Atlas? 
and they took it very well and they responded um, uh, particularly uh, vigorously in the last few years. I kept, keep getting um, butterfly atlases from France and uh, certainly some, some of the most of the southern French uh, regions are well covered now and that's um, there's a lot more happening and my colleague Jude Locke who does the website for um, the European Butterflies Group and lives in the Pyrenees uh, she does an enormous amount to coordinate and keep in touch with what's happening in France and then it's good uh, there's a very good atlas for the Iberian Peninsula in France uh, in um, Spain um, that was done by Miguel Mungrera and one or two other people and they basically you know they've got good butterflies and uh, they know pretty well where they are. Germany hasn't got nearly as many butterflies as France uh, but, but, but they know where they are. Um, in Eastern Europe it's pretty you know some countries are very good. The Swiss butterfly fauna is extremely well known and in Greece, it has an atlas, but it is largely the one, the work of one individual who doesn't drive and he doesn't use a butterfly net. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And I think the next slide, there he is. This is Lazaros Pamperis, who's produced two editions of the Butterflies of Greece. Uh, he usually, well, he gave away uh, uh, most of the copies to anyone who wanted them because he produced it in Greek and in and, and in English. And for the last 30 years, he's been walking the mountains of Greece, recording the butterflies and getting records from people like me. And he's done a, a, a magnificent job in um, identifying, uh, the, well, find, finding new species and um, documenting the distribution of butterflies in Greece. Um, and there's still a few problems. You know, the Greeks aren't, uh, uh, well, there's a, quite a problem of collecting in Greece, usually by foreigners, because there's who are selling stuff on eBay. Um, and also massive changes in the um, grazing patterns in Greece, which I will come to in a minute. So, Europe's areas of high biodiversity uh, for butterflies are nearly always in the mountains. So you've got the Alps system here, you've got the Greek mountains, you've got the Pyrenees, you've got the Carpathians, and you've got things like the Montes Universales in Spain. And the altitudinal range is one of the important things for that. Um, when you've got mountains, you often get speciation because there are butterflies that live at the top of mountains that are separated from butterflies that live at, um, not very far away. Um, and you can consider things like all the Arabia species um, who uh, are really the specialists of mountain grasslands. So uh, there's, there's a general decline in range of, of and many countries have lost more butterflies than we have. For instance, we've lost the large copper, the large blue has been reintroduced, but we also had mazarine blue and black vein white and large tortoiseshell until sometime fairly recently. And the UK has had a catastrophic decline in its butterfly numbers and their distribution since 1950. But Belgium has lost 16 species, many in the last 20 years. And most of Brit uh, Europe's butterfly species, if you follow that graph, are declining um, because Butterfly Conservation Europe has set up a national transect monitoring, uh, an international transect monitoring system with transects being run in different parts of Europe and that now feeds into a sort of a, an index of butterflies which is being accepted by things like the European Union. Now remember most butterflies in Europe are associated with grassland 
only 30 of the 420 species of butterflies in Europe use tree species as their larval food plant. And this is in contrast to the tropics, where, for example, in Ghana, 80 percent of the, of the 900 plus species are associated with relic patches of tropical forests. And similarly in Costa Rica, where there are more th than 2000 species of butterfly, most of these are associated with tropical forests. And I've, I was in Goa recently, and nearly all the butterflies in Goa are associated with tropical forests and not with um, grassland. Now in Europe, it is nearly always grassland. Note that you know other species of Lepidoptera like moths make extensive use of tree species, but grassland um, is is the sort of typical European butterfly environment, and it has to be normally um, uh, maintained as grassland either by grazing or to some extent by cutting, and that usually has to be part of an agricultural production system. There are very few places like the Swiss Natural Park where it's only wild herbivores. So that's a uh, scare thief diving into the long grass to lay its egg. And uh, that occurs in a few places in Europe. It's a grassland butterfly. In the Alps, you find some very interesting rich places for butterflies with a di diversity of habitat. You get things that find only in the valley bottom. You find things on the mountains uh, above the tree line, and you find other butterflies in the gaps in the forest here on the, on the side. And this is only maintained by having some form of transhuman agriculture. And transhumans is the movement of livestock to the mountains for the summer. So you've got mountain areas with very good butterflies. So the, the, the trouble is that the small farmers in many of these um, countries um, are giving up because it's jolly hard work and they get old and their sons don't want to do it. So um, you find the situation where a lot of the small holdings and small farms in the Pyrenees and to some extent the Alps and, uh, and in places like Piedmont um, are, be, are being um, undergrazed and abandoned and you get a reversion to scrub and then secondary woodland. And that, that so when when the, the woodland takes over, the butterflies disappear. Now, the, for instance, the um, hermit is a is a butterfly that lo likes extremely heavy grazing and is nearly always found uh, very close to things like sheep pens and uh, places where there's loads of livestock. See the the whole point about mountain agriculture is that you get snow on the mountains in the winter and uh, the livestock move down either to um, sheds where they eat hay or they move to warmer places uh, and they travel back to the mountains in for the summer uh, often from a distance. Sometimes these were done by people walking the livestock. And uh, for instance, in Greece, they would go down to the coast, but they would go to put, walk up to Mount Smolikas or somewhere like that, um, taking two weeks to walk, um, you know, their, their big flocks of sheep um, from their winter quarters to their summer area uh, in the mountains. Now, the these, this sort of thing has been going on since prehistoric times. Uh, it has always been there because the grassland in, in the, um, on, the, on the mountains would otherwise be ungrazed, uh, except by wild animals, um, and therefore provides a very useful resource for farmers, which they want to use. And the alpine su summer pastures grazed by Chapel, sh cattle, sheep, and pigs produce 
very often milk, and the milk is normally used for cheese, which is a storable and tradable commodity. I remember going to uh, a very sad place in the um, center of Italy where the old men still did cheese rolling. It was a bit like um, playing bowls or something like that. They rolled a cheese and see that see they could see how far they could roll it. But they, the whole community had lost all its livestock and was um, there weren't any it wasn't anyone farming under the age of about 70 and most of the farmers had given up completely. So 50, 100 years ago, milk production and the production of, of particularly hard cheeses were an important um, um, op opportunity for these people to produce something that could be traded. You can put a big cheese on the side of a donkey and you can take it down to the market and you can sell it. And it's jolly valuable stuff. And that's where things like Parmesan came from. So um, it's different in different places, but uh, the normal pattern in the mountains is that you send all your stock uh, up to the mountain pastures where there's plenty of grass and you milk there. I, I remember seeing a chap milking at 2,000 meters in the um, in Switzerland, and he it was it sort of snowed in August. It was it was an extraordinary place where it was really cold some of the time and really sunny some, the rest of the time, and incredibly good butterflies. Now, in when they the livestock go to the mountain pastures, they make hay as winter feed for the livestock. And not all of the land can be cut. So, you know, you get when you've got sort of little tiny fields and very steep fields and they, they in, in particularly in Switzerland, they um, they make hay where they possibly can because they've got very strict rules on their agriculture. And um, there are plenty of edges, there's plenty of habitat for the butterflies and the butterflies uh, do quite well because they, they aren't cut too early, the hay fields aren't cut too early and although sometimes they have two crops of hay in a year the, the butterflies also manage two generations you know things like glanville for artillery for a start. The other characteristic bank and agriculture is it's very it's 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 always a mosaic you've got lots of rock and ski slope, scree slopes. You've got extensively grazed woodland below the tree line where you wouldn't normally be able to do anything in there at all except grow trees, but often uh, there's livestock there. There's very few permanent fences because when you've got lots of snow, the, 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 the snow is uh, tears down the fences and lower down where you've got lots of termites, they tend to eat all the, the the fence posts very quickly. Often the way the mountain agriculture works is communal grazing with common grazing rights rather than ownership of individual plots. And actually this was common in Wales until not long ago where uh, you often had uh, a summer home for the shepherd on the mountain where the the sheep were taken um, for for the summer, um, just to make use of the grass, and the, these pattern these patterns of grazing have been the same for a long time. Um, when you've got no fences, you normally have shepherded grazing, and it's very difficult um, in some of the mountains to get stuff up there by tractor because it's too steep or too difficult. I've known them use things like helicopters in 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 the in the French Alps in the in some of the uh, national parks um, because it's um, it's uh, very inaccessible but they want to have to take the livestock to the mountains not only for the point of view of maintaining the um, biodiversity which it, which they they do but also because the sheep, that is what the shepherds want themselves. They want it to grow their sheep. 
So you you in an alpine pasture or an alpine situation, you often have a huge range of altitudes in a very small area. You've got d different aspects and length of snow cover, giving a range of habitats for butterflies. And you, they are often very floristically diverse with things, loads and loads of different flowers there. There's usually plenty of nectar all summer. They're unplowed and they're unfertilized and it's only works through um, transhumans. And there's a mosaic of grassland and woodland and rock. So that, 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 that works very well. Uh, that's one of the places where we go. Often in Switzerland, you get these mountain um, cattle. Uh, often they are there for just a short period. And this again is Switzerland. It's one of the few places in Europe I've seen people use a hay rake. That's quite unusual to see people. And this is the richest country in Europe, or one of the richest countries. And they have an agricultural system with much higher subsidies for farmers, which is why they're not in the economic uh, uh, the EU, and they pay their farmers, but at the same time, <coughs> they make sure the farmers do things um, in a very uh, well organized way for wildlife and and um, biodiversity. They're not allowed to use bring in much in the way of. Um, supplementary feeds. So they try and make as much hay as they can, and that works. Uh, but often uh, they would use uh, finger mowers, which are hand operated, not, not tractors. Uh, you, this lady's using a hay rake. Uh, this lady's uh, gathering the hay loose, uh, and they carry it back to their um, little houses in the field as, as well. So that they, they have different system a very different system than we do you know we just make big bales now the small bales have almost completely disappeared yeah these um it's very interesting uh, how swiss farming is so different from um the neighboring countries in, in other places austria is quite similar i don't know how they get away with it but they do um, the French um, um, and the, the there's more abandonment in Italy I found than in than in, in France uh, it, uh, and Italian farmers in the Apennines um, were, were really struggling. You get people who, uh, because the French are so absolutely besotted with their food. Things like an alpine cheese factory milking 17 or 18 cows can actually make a living, um, whereas uh, that will be considered completely impossible in the UK, uh, because and often the appellation controle for um, the um, the cheese, um, um, some of the cheeses have uh, 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 you know a sort of a regionals, a typical, um, um, I can't remember the word for it, but the sort of, um, they are a protected um, type uh, of a region and their rules are often made very good for the wildlife, particularly butterflies, and um, uh, maintain the quality of the cheese. In Greece, this is going very rapidly. When I first went to Greece more than 50 years ago, uh, there were goats, flocks of goats in, and sheep in most villages, and they were all milked by hand. And they would go out in the morning um, with the shepherd, and uh, he would range in the hills with his sheep and his goats, and he returned to his village in the evening and he would milk them and they would make feta and yogurt and um, they would make a living out of it. Uh, often, um, it, you know, it, in 2003, they, there were collections or small churns going down the mountain to the cheese factory. 
but actually they can't make a living anymore. And a lot of this is given up completely. And it's terribly sad because not only does it have an effect on the environment, um, but actually I think the quality of the milk and the quality of the cheeses and the yogurts and things like that is not the same when it come, it's come from a, a more intensive uh, concentrate type system um, because it's the wild herbs and the wild, um, you know, produce, have uh, flavors in them and chem chemicals in them, which um, comes through in the, in, into the yogurt and, and, and the feta and gives it some flavor. This guy's gone. Um, I remember helping him milk or had hand milking uh, when I saw him in 2003. I was, I've been there back several times and he, he's given it up. It, it's no, no way to make a living. A lot of places in Greece, the sheep and the goats are being replaced by cattle because cattle uh, don't need so much work and uh, they survive outside. And um, if people hit them with a car, the car comes off very badly. Whereas uh, if you hit a goat, the goat comes off even worse than, uh, um, you know, the car's not affected so much. Uh, so you can you can graze cattle beside the road, but if you graze goats beside the road, it's it's quite quite tricky. When you think about it, the mountains of southern Europe have had very little change over five thousand years until recently. You know, that, for instance, when I first went to Greece, there were donkeys everywhere. Every village had uh, half a dozen donkeys uh, tethered outside it because they didn't have cars in those days, they had donkeys. Nowadays, the Greek peasants and their, particularly their children have moved to the cities to obtain a higher standard of living. And most of the remaining peasants are particularly old and most of the young move away. It's very difficult to compete with industrial farming uh, in the rest of Europe and uh, the idea of having your own flock of sheep and goats for your own family is really just not an economic proposition anymore. It's far too labor intensive. So the, the number of flocks has uh, increased to some extent that's been compensated by having very large flocks, but even that's going very quickly. Now the mountains of Greece are very flower rich. They've got, um, they're not fertilized. It's usually only seasonal summer grazing uh, because they will be on the lowlands during the winter. They're covered in snow in the winter. Uh, they're obviously not plowed. There's often a mosaic with woodland. They, the, the ownership is very different from the UK. <coughs> they're owned by the uh, community and people have rights over it, but that's it. There are very few fences and they're absolutely fantastic for butterflies. But nowadays um, we're tending to go towards uh, having um, cattle. Uh, and quite often this is a, this is abandoned um, pasture on the Albanian border. And it's quite frequently that um, uh, they um, give it all up very often they just take the subsidy they're supposed to keep their flocks but no one checks uh you, you've got shepherds who um they just treat it as a pension and almost no one under the age of about 60 wants to even join um i did meet a few um <coughs> a couple of shepherds this year but they were older than i were i am i don't i don't know how much is this is going on but I, I suspect it's quite much commoner than people think that people keep sheep indoors um, to produce things like uh, feta and goat's milk and, and sheep milk. Um, but that doesn't benefit the butterflies. You buy in <coughs> hay and straw, um, fodder for them and you can obviously produce the food, 
but it, it, it doesn't have the same sense uh, of uh, continuity in and uh, influence on the landscape. There are some areas that are still overgrazed. <coughs> this is a, a sheep pen which is kept at night full of sheep. Um, he's obviously off in the hill somewhere today, but these are flax from, this is on Mount Smolikas on, in northern Greece, and these are unusual because the black minority in Greece are almost entirely shepherds, and they, they persist in shepherding much longer than everybody else. So a lot of the butterflies that you find there actually tolerate uh, the grazing quite well. You've got some prickly hawthorns um, and things like black rain wines will do, do well on that. The spines protect the cows. <coughs> Sorry. The spines of the hawthorns uh, re resist the grazing and the um, and the caterpillars are protected as well as the, the, the plant. This is uh, Mount Kelmos in uh, uh, the Peloponnese. I, when I first went here, there were very large, this was in 2004, there were very large herds of sheep and goats, mainly run by Albanians who were exporting milk um, in taking the milk down to uh, a milk processing plant somewhere. And it, it was virtually overgrazed. Everyone complained about it being overgrazed. It's now undergrazed. There are, they've replaced the, um, the sheep with cattle and uh, um, it's less grazed than it was, which probably for some butterflies like Kelmos Blue is a good thing because uh, the uh, uh, sand foins that the Kelmos Blue feed on um, are very palatable to sheep. In Eastern Europe, um, this is in um, Hungary, you've got some areas of high nature value farmland that are not actually in the mountains. And this is, um, this is semi-natural grassland in Hungary, uh, because when the grassland was given back to the people, the tradition of keeping livestock had been broken by years of communist rule. Although they make hay out of it, most of that hay is burnt in power stations and they don't have any livestock. This is, this is a few years ago, but um, how long that will continue, I don't know. They were cutting the hay, sometimes leaving it in the field, sometimes taking it away to burn, but there were virtually no livestock. And that's the uh, uh, scarce large, large blue, uh, which, um, uh, was feeding on these, you know, started off with these Sangris orbia plants. Um, we did a survey, this is European Butterflies Group, um, did a survey in R Romania for one of Europe's most threatened butterflies, the Danube clouded yellow. Uh, it's gone extinct in Austria, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, and Slovenia, but it still just about occurs in uh, Romania. And we found two populations there. There are still populations in Belarus and probably Ukraine. I'm not sure I'm gonna to go to Ukraine to find out though. Um, it's still found in Slovakia and Poland. <coughs> and we've looked in Bulgaria, but we haven't found it. <coughs> it's um, quite easy to distinguish between uh, from the normal Colias crocus, the clouded yellow, but that's very rare in that area anyway. It's the absence of veins across the uh, black area. So we found two areas in Romania, um, one near uh, Cluj, and uh, it feeds as a larva on this broom plant. Um, and uh, that seems to be quite common, or at least it, it seems to be common in these areas. It's uh, quite vulnerable 
um, to being overgrazed because it let the little eggs are laid at the end of the broom um, stalks. And uh, when the cattle come and munch it, they tend to eat, um, eat them out. That's two generations in a year. And uh, it's, it's still very scarce, but um, we did manage to get the areas protected. Whether that means anything, I don't know. Um, but um, it, it, it seems to uh, um, depend on relatively light grazing by cattle um, um, and probably very late grazing as well. And uh, whether it's been properly managed, I don't know. It's a sort of <coughs> uh, open, unfenced um, landscape of it, very extensive grazing, very few um, fences. There's um, occasional shepherds. Very often these people have their own cow. The, uh, the cow herd takes them all up to the pastures during the day and they come back to their homes at night and are milked by the lady of the house. So it's not, it, not a system that uh, is familiar to us. It's often um, these areas are partly merging with the forest. So um, that's actually quite a good thing. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there's an interaction between the grass and the forest and at, at that point they the uh, butterfly seems to do well it needs a, a large uh, area to work um and it's you usually find the um both food plant and callus mamadoni in the uh, least grazed areas Occasionally, you have uncut terraces on the hay fields, which will do well for um, the hay, the okay, um, the broom and the butterfly. It's a very primitive agriculture. You know, you don't see that in Wales very often. People carrying loose hay and pulling it with a horse. And there's a haystack outside somebody's house, which is going to feed that cow for their cow for the winter. So the food plant is very vulnerable to heavy grazing, but also um, a lot of the area has now been planted with um, Sitka spruce. And although we have um, uh, changed the you know, it's been protected in some way, whether that's actually men, made any difference, I don't know. Um, it's it's quite a difficult to get stuff to happen in places like Romania. And we've always failed to find a Romanian who will sort of get involved and lead it for us. Um, most of the people involved are either Hungarian or German or coming in from outside. And it, it requires some local to take it on, really. Now, I'm going to end by talking about an area of, it's not in Europe, but it's not far from Europe, <coughs> which I visited last summer. Again, um, it's in northeast Turkey. And this is a very interesting um, uh isolated, self-sufficient community, which has a pastoral system, which is largely unaffected by modern agriculture. And it, they use extensive, utilize extensive mountain pasture going up to 4,000 meters. And this is the Kachkar Mountains in Eastern Turkey, uh, right on the Georgian border. And it's like going back into the not the 20th century, but the 19th century. It's extraordinary. One, you've got wonderful flowers. This is <coughs> this is the Black Sea, and this area is up here near Armenia and Azerbaijan. It's very high. There's wonderful mountains because the mountains are covered by snow most of the year. 
So they go up to utilize the high pastures. <coughs> And they stay up uh, to the first snows and um, then come down the mountain. They probably have several different houses. It's, they have wonderful little villages. The butterfly species list is at least 180 species. We had, I think, 135 in a week. There's some important endemics and the butterflies have huge abundance as well as having huge diversity. And the butterflies are well adapted to this traditional pastoral system. Uh, they had made progress. Um, this is on my first visit. And <clears throat> this is the ladies cutting hay with sickles. And this summer, I didn't see any ladies cutting hay with sickles, but I did see men cutting hay with scythes, which is fantastic progress. Uh, particularly for the ladies. And um, that that is extraordinary to have that sort of thing ha still happening it is amazing. Uh, no one uses the scythe in the UK at all, or practically no one, certainly no one doing, trying to feed an animal for the winter. Has wild, wonderful butterflies, uh, things like Camberwell Beauty, Little Tiger Blue, um, and hundreds of blues. And it was, um, they only go up to these summer camps for a couple of months. The mountain roads going in and out are often blocked by snow and rock falls. So it's, it's a very different um, environmental system than most people would even think of. And um, Green Wings do a tour there, strongly recommend it. It's uh, one of the most interesting places I've ever been to. And I was very pleased to go back uh, and help with that tour this year. They have these little cattle. Um, and when the mountaineer, uh, they don't have many vehicles. And we took our camping gear up the mountain in 2009 with a, uh, a chap carrying the stuff on a, on a, on a mule. And... Uh, when he came to fetch us, he was late. And he said, why? we said, why are you late? And he said, well, my cow was attacked by a bear in the cow shed and I had to deal with it. He wasn't explicit about what actually he had done to the bear, but I can imagine. Um, it's, a, it's an extraordinary place and very interesting. And it's, it is so unusual to see something quite uh, different to our modern life and um, not humbling, but it, it gives you a, a, a sort of insight into history, uh, uh, which I really value. These are where they put keep the hay. It's full of fantastic butterflies like this uh, Damon Blue. There's a the tracks up there are pretty pretty dodgy, but that you you can get. And that's it. Uh, should we go back to stop share? Thank you, Simon. Fascinating, Hello. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much indeed. Now, we do have a little bit of time. I've got a couple of questions in the chat room, if you're okay to. That's fine by me. Voice left after uh, that. So I've got a question from um, Andrew Warlow here. It's great talk. If Eastern Europe is heading for intensive farming, and this is affecting their local wildlife. Is there any hope left for Western Europe and the UK reversing this trend? I don't think the UK will reverse this trend. I, it'd be nice to think they did, but uh, uh, I, uh, it, it, I see no. I think there will be a you know a few more neps. There will be a few large areas where. Uh, wildlife takes precedent because people like the National Trust and the RSPB have sort of got to deal with the with the government to to do it. But when it comes to your average farmer, they those people are struggling and they will struggle even more without subsidies and they will tend to intensify without struggling. And I I I don't 
when you saw uh, Jeremy Clarkson go through all that nonsense, he did one of the best things he ever, anyone's ever done for farming. Uh, and he had this interview with his accountant at the end of the year, and he'd been working his socks off all year. And uh, he asked uh, Cheerful Charlie, I think he calls him, how much did we make? And he said, you made 141 quid. And that's, you know, you've got you've got to own 3,000 acres to start with, or you and um, it's very difficult to make a living. Um, and I have a great deal of sympathy for farmers. Yes, if you've got the right sort of land, particularly if you've got a lot of it and you don't owe, owe the uh, government, uh, the banks any money, then you're going to do quite well. You can you can afford to uh, entertain a bit of wildlife. I think Scotland will probably do better, um, but I don't think we're going to be leading the um, way back to. Uh, having vast quantities of biodiversity, unless they all go bust and it all gets abandoned for a bit. Andrew's got a follow-up question. Um, experts are suggesting that veganism is the only way to save wildlife. However, the evidence seems that subsidised organic meat and dairy farming would be an idea. What are your thoughts on that? I'm a great meat eater. I'm quite used. I quite enjoy having my well, I've enjoyed having my own meat um, uh, over the last um, 30 or 40 years. And uh, it, most of Wales, you, you can't do much else with it, really, except keep keep some form of livestock. And actually, if you keep livestock um, in reasonably small numbers, it's not bad for wildlife. It's just that you can't make a profit out of it. And... Uh, but the still, you still need to be able to, you know, if conservation grazing only really works, you've got to market for the product. So I'm not going to become a vegan, thank you. <laughs> I didn't think you would, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a quick question, uh, just to um, confirmation, is hay rattle the same as yellow rattle, I presume? Yeah, it is the same rattle. So yellow rattle is and hay rattle, binanthus or whatever it is, yeah. We have no, anybody else got any other questions they want to pose via the chat button before we perhaps wrap this up? No, there's nothing in there at the moment. Simon, from all the, I'll ask you one quick question. From all the places you've had the, uh, the pleasure of visiting in Europe, where's, where's, where have you seen the biggest sort of downturn in butterfly diversity and numbers over your travels? I, I, the one that worries me most is bits of Greece, mm -hmm. not because it's totally lost its diversity, but I, but I, it's just changed so much from very intensive um, sheep and goat production to um, to cattle. Uh, how that will work out, I don't really know. Uh, the worst place in many ways is Wales that I'm very familiar with because. Uh, so little left here. Uh, there are parts of Europe which still have um, really quite good wildlife uh, still left. You know, uh, places like places I I think are marvelous. Uh, apart from the Alps the, you know, and the Pyrenees, which are the obvious ones, but uh, Romania, uh, bits of Bulgaria, the Montes Universalis in Spain are, are really quite special. Um, the Akran National Park in France is really quite special, and you can still find really good butterflies if you go and look. Um, that's very exciting. Um, I th it's um, it's the lowlands that seem to go particularly quickly, and that that's a bit of a struggle. I haven't been back to Hungary. I'm sure that's changed rather badly. Okay. Thank you. Well, we haven't got any more. I've got a number of thanks for a very interesting talk from a number of people. I'm going to wrap it up there. I'm going to call, uh, stop the recording now. So uh, people are now then free to leave. We've finished the talk. So thank you very much. Simon, if you'd hang on a second, I'd like to have a quick chat with you about something. Yeah.